So this is our second lecture in refrigeration and heat pump systems. Last time we spent a lot of time on the Carnot refrigeration and we need to move into the vapor compression refrigeration. So uh, last time I introduced the problem and th th requ requested that the rate of cooling, Q dot E, be calculated both in kilowatts as well as in tons of refrigeration. And so just to emphasize, a ton of refrigeration is a rate of heat removal. So it's 200 BTUs per minute or it's 211 kilojoules per minute. That's a conversion factor that you would use. And that's the way in air conditioning and refrigeration they often quote how big of a unit it is, how much heat can it remove in tons. This is a problem we set up and solved last time. Just as a reminder, for the Carnot vapor compression, I mean, so va the Carnot vapor refrigeration cycle, you have major components of a compressor, a condenser, a turbine, and an evaporator, and the fluid flows through each component continually. So we're operating steady state. It comes in at low pressure. And outside, after the compressor, it just happens to be perfectly saturated vapor at high pressure. Hence, uh, you can condense it. And when it condenses, it comes out of the condenser with negligible pressure drop as saturated liquid. When it does that, the temperature at 2 is equal to the temperature at 3. It's constant temperature heat rejection and that's key to the performance and so this is at that temperature th the high temperature so over on a temperature entropy diagram we can plot two lines of constant pressure this is a line of high pressure and we know that p the state two is on that line as well as state three on that line they have the same pressure ph and if it just happens to be saturated vapor at state two and saturated liquid, all of that heat transfer out of the working fluid in that condenser occurs at the high temperature TH. All right. Then the turbine extracts some work. It's isentropic, S equal to a constant, just like the compressor, the perfect compressor, S equal to a constant. So there's straight lines up and down from three down to four and from one up to two. And their constant pressure in the evaporator, so P1 is equal to P4, that's the low pressure. Here's a line of constant pressure, low pressure. And so state four and state one are on that line. And we can see that the evaporation is occurring at the low temperature, TL. All of the heat that goes into the working fluid goes in at TL, that low temperature. So then we plot the Carnot uh, vapor refrigeration cycle on a TS diagram. It's a rectangle tucked under the dome. We actually analyzed this problem. We calculated that it was 10.7 watts, or around three tons of cooling. It required 1.94 watts uh, sorry, kilowatts to drive the compressor or to drive the system. It's the compressor minus the turbine output. And the coefficient of performance was 5.50. This was a table of properties where I encouraged you to go ahead and make a table and pressure and temperature, put temperature in degrees C, temperature in degrees K, uh, quality, enthalpy, entropy. And uh, you can see that the entropy at state 2 is equal to the entropy at state 1. Likewise, the entropy at state 3 is equal to the entropy at state 4. And the key is to get those enthalpies. From the enthalpies, compute the heat transfer in the evaporator, the heat transfer in the condenser, the net Q. That net Q is out of the system the work of the compressor, the work of the turbine, the work net, which is into the system. Compare the work net and the Q net. If they're different, look for an error. Energy is conserved for this system. 
Then you can uh, compute things like uh, Q dot that's happening in the evaporator. It'll be the mass flow rate, M dot, times the specific heat transfer in the evaporator, represented in three units, kilojoules per minute, kilowatts, or tons of refrigeration. Those were the answer for part A and B. Then the power for the drive the system, it'll be W net times M dot in either kilojoules per minute or for kilowatts. And the last, the coefficient of performance computed using either the analytic expression for the Carnot refrigeration efficiency, TL over TH minus TL, where those temperatures are in Kelvin, and you get 5.5, or from this data above, coefficient of performance was what you desired, a large heat removal in the evaporator divided by the net power or work per unit mass to drive the system. All that look good? Hopefully it's all in context in your mind. You can rep reproduce that on an exam. Did I show you the temperature entropy diagram that's plotted in RefProp? And then go ahead and fix the states. This is a line of about 550 kilopascal. That would be the low pressure. This is a line of 2,033 kilopascal, high pressure. And so right here is state one. Right here, no, no, I'm sorry, that's state two. This is state one. This is state three. And this is state four. That's what it would look like. Okay. Well, that's not practical. Why is it not practical? How can we make it practical? Well, in a vapor compression refrigeration system, this is where we started with Carnot, but we want to have a more practical system, so we'll just call it the vapor compression refrigeration system. It should be named after somebody, but it's not. You know, it should be the, the carrier cycle, just like the Brayton cycle or the auto cycle, or the diesel cycle. You know, we should name it after somebody, but it's not named after anybody. So we're still going to have a condenser. We'll still have an evaporator, and we'll still have a compressor. But what's not practical is this turbine, which takes in saturated liquid and then go comes out with some two-phase uh, vapor, liquid mixture. So the goal is it needs to drop the pressure from the high pressure to the low pressure. So what you have is you say what device can drop pressure? We'll put in a, we'll just put in a expansion valve. It's going to degrade the performance because the expansion valve just by nature is not going to be reversible. It's irreversible. And then the other thing is, uh, to come out with saturated vapor, you had to ingest a two-phase mixture at state one. Well, compressors like to ingest gases or vapors. So it's better to have this ingest saturated vapor. And that's the big change. So we still have our numbering system, state one, state two, state three, state four. But then this is not going to have the efficiency or the co high coefficient of performance that the Carnot had. Also, if you're going to ingest saturated vapor, what do you think the output at state two is going to be? Superheated. superheated. It's superheated vapor. Let's go back and take a look at that TS diagram. Here's this TS diagram. So we're going to shift state one to right here. If you shift it there, where is state two going to be? Is it going to be here? Or is it going to be here? It's got to go to that high pressure. Your condenser is still going to be essentially, you neglect friction flow through the condenser, the pressure inlet's equal to the pressure outlet. So this is your new state two. Well, so you're going to have some cooling in the condenser of the superheated vapor just so it can become saturated vapor and then you're going to have the rest of the cooling at constant temperature until you bring out saturated liquid. So state three 
stays the same location. But two changes and one change. How about state four? Where is the, is the state four the same as what it was for the car? No. No, it moves over here and we put a dashed line indicating its re irreversible expansion. And state four has a higher entropy. This is x axis is entropy. It's shifted over, it's increased the entropy due to irreversibilities in the expansion valve. So this is the, what the diagram looks like now. We've modified it for our uh, vapor compression refrigeration. If somebody says, oh, we don't have a great compressor. We have a compressor with 80% isentropic efficiency. Where is state two going to move if we have an efficiency for the compressor? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go up here. It's going to still have to go to that 2,033 kilopascals, but it's now going to be doing it irreversibly. Hence, state two will be up like that. It'll be even higher temperature. This is temperature scale on the x-axis. More superheating. Hence, there'll be more heat transfer at high temperature to reject it. All right. So the make sure we understand the major differences between the Carnot and this practical Carnot or the vapor compression refrigeration system is that the expansion valve replaces the turbine. It's irreversible. Saturated vapor is at the inlet to the compressor, not the outlet to the compressor. And all of that, that, that heat transfer out here in the condenser, some of it now this is superheated right here. So some of it occurs where T2 is going to be greater than the temperature H or greater than temperature at 3. It's, it's greater than the saturation temperature for the pressure of the condenser. And so that's going to be a source of uh, degradation of performance because you want for... for uh, you want all the heat to go out at the same high temperature TH. Well, now we have more heat going out or some heat going out at a higher than the saturation temperature of the condenser. Here's a problem. Should we go ahead and solve it? You want to solve this problem or skip it? Solve it. So we take the same fluid that we worked with with the Carnot and we just do it with the same conditions and compare for the vapor compression site system. So we have R22 is the working fluid in the vapor compression refrigeration cycle. The evaporator pressure, now often they quote the pressure for the evaporator, but it has the same corresponding saturation temperature of 2 degrees C. So we quote pressures in the evaporator. And the pressure in the condenser is the same 2033 kilopascal, which is corresponds to the saturation temperature of 52 degrees C. Saturated liquid exits a condenser, like we've been talking, and the mass flow rate's the same, 5 kilograms per minute. Determine now the rate of heat transfer to the refrigerant passing through the evaporator. So a couple things you want to do is go ahead from memory, sketch those components. Condenser, evaporator, compressor, expansion valve. Go ahead and remind yourself of the direction of the flow. Go ahead and introduce those states. Try to stay consistent with the textbook that, so that you can compare and check your work. Make a table of properties uh, as well as make a diagram. So let's go ahead and sketch in a, a temperature entropy diagram. There's the dome. There's our line of high pressure and low pressure. And so we'll think about state one, state two, state three, state four. I know that's a lot to remember, but you, you need to get that in your mind and be able to recall it. I, I encourage you from memory by solving a lot of problems. Then make a table. So the table is the state, one, two, three, four, the pressure in kilopascal, 
temperature and degree C, um, maybe entropy, not entropy, quality, maybe enthalpy in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Oops, getting ahead of myself. Entropy in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And think about how those states are determined. State one was saturated vapor, true? So f we, we know the pressure of the evaporator. The pressure of the evaporator is 531.3 kilopascal. And we know the quality is one. It's, so this is gonna be H of G and S of G at that pressure. And this will be T sat at that pressure, true? Okay. How about state two? So state two is, no, is fixed by knowing the pressure. Oh, it goes to 2033. And what else? Entropy, isentropic compression. Now, if you had a efficiency for that compressor, I would introduce state 2S and then 2 actual and do it as a two-step process. So this uh, S2 is equal to S1. And so knowing the pressure and entropy, you're able to get the well, with a little work, H2 and <coughs> T2, you could get it. You would sh see that T2 is greater than the saturation temperature of 52 degrees C for that condenser. All right, let's just kind of go through this conceptually s some more. State three, well, state three is saturated liquid, right? So it's the high pressure, 2033, with the quality of zero. So this will be H of F and S of F at that high pressure. And this will be the T sat at that high pressure. Are these two temperatures the same right here? No, 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 no. One's hot, one's high temperature. Which one's the high temperature, T3 or T1? T3 is the high temperature, very good. All right, now <coughs> let's go take a look at state four. It's what pressure? We're back to low pressure, aren't we? So we're at 531.3. We are going to be in the two-phase region, so it's going to be the T sat at the low. So guess what? Is T1 and T4 the same? Yeah, you can see that from that TS diagram. We don't know what the quality is, but we'll be able to calculate it. But what helps us is what's that second piece of information that helps fix state four? We do a first law analysis and we conclude something about the enthalpy. The enthalpy at the exit of that expansion valve is equal to the enthalpy flowing into that expansion valve. So pressure and enthalpy fix state four. We're able to get S4 and X4 from that. All right? Okay. Um, I think I have numbers on the next slide, so let me show you those numbers for this problem. So here are all the pressures, the temperatures. Notice the 2 degrees, the 52 degrees, the 2 degrees, that makes sense. Look how hot it comes outside after that compressor. It's 73.3 degrees C. So it has to cool from 73.3 degrees C in the first part of that condenser. It's not condensing, it's just cooling till it gets to 52 degrees C, and then once it's at 52, it continues through the condenser and is actually condensed. All right. Um, and it comes out at 52 degrees C. Uh, you can see the quality. So what's happening here is you're going across and the quality at state four is around 30%. What does that mean? It's a two-phase mixture at state four. Some of it's liquid, some of it's vapor. It's in equilibrium with itself, the liquid and vapor in equilibrium. How much by mass is in the liquid state if the quality is 30%? How much is vapor? The vapor is 30% by mass. And so what's the liquid? fraction, 70%. So you've got 30% of it vapor and 70% liquid. 
So when it goes through this evaporator, it's going to come out at the same pressure, the same temperature. It came in at 2 degrees C, it goes out at 2 degrees C. But the quality, it goes from 30% to 100%, it goes out saturated vapor. So the 70% now boils or evaporates. And that's the reason for the heat absorption. That's the reason for the picking up that heat transfer in that evaporator. You could check your H's, that looks good. The S's, that looks good. Um, there's a higher S at four because of the irreversibility. Here are the numbers. So, uh, we used to have, for the Carnot, we used to get like 3.04 tons. Now we get 3.31 tons, so you, it's higher for the same mass flow rate, okay? Well, one of the reasons is you push this to be saturated vapor. You didn't stop it and then bring it out, okay? So if I look at the length of the line traversed uh, at this bottom, that length of that line has been increased. So for the same mass flow rate, five kilograms per minute flow rate going in this loop, five kilograms per minute, I'm getting a greater cooling. That sounds great. Let's take a look at the power requirement. Oh, hold it. I used to be able to do that with 1.94 kilowatts. Now I need 2.81 more power more power, okay? And the coefficient of performance, which is a normalized metric, it used to be 5.50. So for every one kilojoule of work provided, I was able to get 5.50 kilojoules of heat removed from the low temperature. That's what the coefficient of performance is saying. But now, with this 4.14, for every one I provide, I'm only able to lift out of that low temperature 4.14 kilojoules of heat. Not as good, is it? So the coefficient of performance is degraded from the Carnot. But it's still a very good refrigeration cycle. It still works and it's practical and we use it all the time. That's what's out there in practice. All of this look good? All right. Why does the refrigerant get cold? Let me, let me step back and think about this for a minute. We brought in saturated liquid. Was that saturated liquid at state three hot or cold? What temperature was that saturated liquid for this problem? We just looked at, what was the temperature? 52 degrees C, right? Wasn't it 52? It's hot liquid, okay. I pass it through this magical device called an expansion valve. The professor said it's a simple device. But it seems like it's a magical device because what comes out at state four? Two degrees C. What's going on here? How can I have a black box, a magical device called an expansion valve where I bring in 52 degrees C and out comes two degrees C? That's not intuitive. And I'll find students that pass thermal one, pass thermal two, A's and all that, and they can solve problems on exams, but they sure don't grasp something like this. And they'll say something and reveal that they just don't understand. What's going on? I don't know. I mean, or they'll, 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 they'll say, this is impossible. But they solve problems correctly. <laughs> so what's the key is look at the pressure. Pressure is high. This is 2033 kPa. What's the pressure down here? It's a low pressure. It's 531.3 kPa. Okay. Then you have to go back and think about your chemistry and think about things like solids, liquids, gases. And there's something different about the molecules floating around that were in a gas state, liquid state, solid state. First of all, can you have water in the solid state? Can you have water in the liquid state? Can you have water in the vapor state or gas state? You can. Can you have even carbon dioxide and all of it? Yes, you can. You can have all of these substances, refrigerants, you don't want to think about that as being in the solid state, but you could have them in all the, what's the difference? You say, well, something's cold. Okay, well, what's a measure, what's cold a measure of? Molecular activity. 
If it's hot, it's really moving around, true? A lot of molecular activity. And molecular activity can be so high that it's able to break some attractions between the molecules. And then it, the temperature may be so low that the molecular activity isn't able to break the attractions between the molecules. Hence, they're in the solid state or liquid state. And so it's a thing called intermolecular forces. It's all in the chemistry class, right? <coughs> Talks about these intermolecular forces, and especially if there's a, like a dipole, like the water, it's got a kind of a positive end and a negative end. It can, you know, the positive and the negative can kind of attach, or you have hydrogen bonding. And I'm not a chemist, okay? But th this is explanation physically of these intermolecular forces. And so what happens is, is when you don't have a high kinetic uh, molecular energy, the intermolecular forces are sufficient to keep it in a liquid state or even get it into a solid state. So as you heat it up, it then wants to go into the vapor, true? Okay, so what happens is, is you have higher intermolecular forces keeping it in that liquid state. But then when you drop the pressure, hey, I, can, I would like to go into some vapor state. To go into the vapor state, you've got to break some of those intermolecular forces. That doesn't come for free, does it? The energy is conserved. So the intermolecular forces or bonds or attractions that are broken have to come from somewhere. Now, it's isolated from the environment. So there is no heat removal from it or heat addition to it. It's adiabatic. Some of them want to go into the vapor state because of the low pressure. And so what you do is you take the, some of it comes and is separated, breaking those intermolecular forces. And then uh, it drops the temperature of the liquid and the vapor all together. It's a shifting or partitioning of the, where the energies are on a molecular level. That's the best I can do. Does it appeal to your intuition? Can you leave this class and know that <laughs> and explain that to somebody? Yes, sir. It's just a re yeah. It's just like your garden hose or anything else. It's just a restriction. Take your finger, put it over the garden hose, which you did when you were young. You're just adding restriction, and you try to block it the whole way. You can't because it's about 60 psi and it comes out. But you're really building the pressure up on the back side and then the low pressure on the other side. Um, just close a valve, and you'll see that pressure drop. That's all it is. It's a very simple device. Now, the way they do this in practice, they may have a capillary tube. They, a lot of engineers have a very well-defined diameter and a well-defined length. And you'll see this capillary tube, and they'll actually coil it someplace in the refrigeration system. And that's a metering device. That gives you the pressure drop. And it's due to the friction of the flow through that small diameter tube. Yeah. So. Uh, Otherwise, they have a, a valve with a seat, something like this. I'm not going to show it that well. And as this valve kind of pulls off the seat, then it opens up a passageway for flow to go through, or it seals back down, opens and closes. And then you can have a system which uh, controls the height of that valve off of that seat. It'll be like a thermostatic expansion valve, a TXV. No, they're common. A lot of engineering went into the building them and designing, but once they kind of ma manufacture them, then they become cheap, right? Cost nothing. Yeah, yeah, really. You can get a very uh, highly engineered valve in the refrigeration application for probably fifty dollars, thirty dollars. Highly engineered. Does a great job of controls and feedback. Well, I didn't bring it, uh, but I usually bring it when I teach Thermo 1. I was going to bring it today, but you can take a can of dust away or some other for electronics to blow the dust off your keyboard or dust off the inside of your computer with the heat sink. 
And what's in this can often is 134A. The can that I had that I bought from the Altec, which is down the street, is 134A. Now, it's restricted because I think some people abuse this, and I don't know if they snort it or drink it. I don't know what they do with it, but it's, you, you, they just have to restrict it so that little kids can't get a hold of it. So, but you take this can, and you can shot, slosh it around, and when you slosh it around, you're detecting something. You're detecting that in this can, in the bottom of the can, maybe that when it's full, is LIQ, and the top part is VAP. You can slosh these cans and feel it. What are you feeling? The presence of liquid and vapor. Okay? So you're supposed to hold the can upright, and when you press on this knob, something comes out to blow the dust off your electronic component. What comes out? It, it's the vapor off the top. True? Now, you can blow this off and you can blow it into a napkin and you can feel the temperature of that and it won't be dramatically different than the temperature of the fluid that's in the can. But guess what happens if you turn this upside down? Turn it upside down. Now where's the liquid? Where the handle is for the nozzle. And if I squeeze it when it's upside down, What's going to be coming through that nozzle? It's the liquid. You're not supposed to do it this way. But this is a very cheap way to demonstrate the reality that you take a liquid at high pressure through a valve, blow it into a napkin, do not blow it onto your skin or the friend's skin or anything. It's very dangerous because it'll get you a freeze burn, right? It'll, you did it the most. Okay, well, <laughs> PETA would like to know your... Uh, <laughs> Um, but it, it'll be very cold, and you can then sense that cold in a napkin, and it's, it's incredible. So there's a physical a a demonstration of something that maybe you think about that some more. How do I take this can that you probably have, some of you have, accessible, you know, blowing air to, or refrigerant. That's typically what's in here because you can get a lot more blowing out. To, uh, the can will last longer to clean your keyboard and electronic components. And then uh, turn it upside down, and you'll just experience a dramatic temperature change of the product coming out. Okay? What pressure are those cans usually at? Well, um, that's a great question. So if you know the temperature of the room that you're in, let's say it's 75 degrees F, okay? And I know it's in two-phase equilibrium. I know the temperature. If I know the refrigerant in there, I can go to my thermodynamics textbook and I can find P sat for that 75 degrees F. Got it? So that you can tell the temperature of the pressure in that can. Let's say somebody reads the label of the can. It says, do not put in direct sunlight and leave there, blah, blah, blah. Do not put in a hot environment. Mm, I wonder what will happen. I'll throw it into my burning fire. I'm, you know, I'm out in the brush and I'm throwing, burning some fire, so I'll take that can. I'll just throw it into the fire. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. What will happen if the temperature of the environment of the can skyrockets because it's in the presence of sunlight or the presence of a fire? The pressure's likely to go up, 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 and something's going to give. And when it gives, it's a little bomb. That's it. Unfortunately, most kids have done this, right? But it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And uh, then it really, boom, it'll really blow. And, uh, yeah, so don't do that without adult supervision <laughs> or even with super adult supervision. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, now, um, so this now I want to talk about residential air conditioning systems. Why do I do this? Well, you pass this class. You're going to go home, whatever. You're going to say, hey, I passed this class. Great. What did you learn? Oh, I learned about energy, thermodynamics. What's the next? They're going to ask you some questions. You learned about air conditioning systems. Great. I've got some problems for you. This is really bug. Can you help me? 
and that, that's what will happen to you. So we want to know a little bit about practical air conditioning for residential, for a house, for an apartment. Okay, here are the components. They're going to have a compressor. You're going to have a condenser. You're going to have an evaporator. You're going to have an expansion valve. You're going to have refrigerant. Maybe it's R22. Maybe it's R134A. Maybe it's R410A. It's going to be flowing in a loop continuously when it's running, right? Then it shuts off. Then it starts up. Don't worry about the transient. Just get the concept of steady state running. Where are those components? So here's a house. This is off of the Goodman Manufacturing. It's a company that produces HVAC equipment, has probably 20% market share in the U.S. for residential air conditioning systems. They're located in what state? Headquartered? Texas. In what city? Houston. And a lot of engineers work for them and uh, can work for them and graduate here and go move in Houston. So it's not like it's an abstract company that's doing some ex exotic thing. And you may look at your house, you may have one of these systems. It, they're, they're, they have about 20% market share of the residential air conditioning systems. And, uh, or you may know a friend that does. Okay. I'm not promoting them, I'm just trying to make it practical to you and your life. Okay. Um, now, uh, the home air conditioning system, typically they're what they call split systems. What do you mean by split? Well, you have part of it outside the house and part of it inside the house. And then you have these lines that are refrigerant lines that connect in the flow. Some refrigerant's flowing one way and the refrigerant's flowing the other way. There's two lines, one bringing it, the refrigerant into the house and one taking it out. So that's your line set. And typically one is bare. You could kind of see it in the illustration. They're copper lines, typically. One is bare, and one has a big, thick mat of insulation over it. All right? So now, what's going on outside? This is the noisy part. There's a fan right here. It's kicking air out. You're drawing air in from the outdoor air, right? What's happening there? You're rejecting heat. And right in here, you have a coil, and that coil takes in air from the in dot inside of your house. Maybe you have a ceiling uh, grate up there with a little filter, in it in, or maybe it's in a wall, and then it goes up the wall and into the furnace, and it goes across this coil, and that warm air that went across the coil, it's now cool, and it goes through a ductwork and gets dumped into different parts of the house, and it's cool. And so you say, ah, I like to sit under the vent because it's so nice. It's nice, cool air in the middle of summer blowing on me, right? So that's what's happening. Oh, I learned thermodynamics, but I sure didn't learn this. Uh, okay, what were the components? What were the components? Uh, which, where's the compressor? Maybe that's the big one. Where is it at? Where do you think the compressor's at? You think when the compressor's running, it's nice and quiet or loud? It's loud. It's going, doo -doo 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 -doo. okay? Guess where they're going to put it? Outside, not inside. It's noise. People complain about noise. Are they going to put it by the master bedroom? Probably not. Probably by the garage somewhere if they can, where the noise. Maybe the neighbor's master bedroom, right? <laughs> um, but there it is. So the compressor is going to be tucked in this unit outside. Now, you have the air, the fan is blowing the air across. Well, it's promoting heat transfer. So is that, there's a big coil that wraps around this box that the air is coming in on all four sides or three of the four sides, and then swooping up and the fan's kicking it out the top. All right, so one of them's a heat, heat exchanger. Is it the condenser or the evaporator? So we now know where the compressor is at. It's tucked in here somewhere, but it's wrapped around by a heat exchanger. What is it? The heat exchanger called the evaporator or the condenser? It is the condenser, and that wraps around three sides or four sides or three and a half sides of it, and the air comes across. Okay, now, so if the condenser is here. And the compressor is here. Where do you think the evaporator is? In the furnace area. That's that coil up in here that the air blows over, 
and makes the air cold. That's the evaporator. Inside the evaporator, refrigerant's evaporating, boiling. It needs heat to boil. It's coming from the warm air blowing over it. You think, that's not that very warm. It's 105 outside, 105 or 100. Let, let's say it's 105 degrees F outside, and my air inside is 75 degrees F, right? So I have 75 degree F air blowing over this coil. Maybe it drops down to 55 degree F air that then gets dumped into the room. 55 degree F air, okay? So it's kind of funny that 75 is the hot air making it evaporate. And because it's making it evaporate, the hot air goes from 75 to 55 F or 75 to 60 F or something like that, okay? This is mind boggling. This is not trivial stuff. I hope you try to grap grapple with it. So that's where the evaporator is. Where's the expansion valve? That was our fourth component. Where do you think the expansion valve is? Okay, let's do this. Let's go on to clicker questions. So, we want to be able to ask all these questions. So the first question, is the compressor located at A, B, C, D, or E? Where is the compressor located in this illustration? The best answer you can find, A, B, C, D, or E. Now, notice that B kind of points to this thing, E kind of points to this thing, A points to that thing, C points to that thing, and D kind of points to that thing. Okay? So that's to help you a little bit. Everybody in? Where is the compressor? We will now stop, and we'll show our results, and... I knew C was going to trip people up, but that's the line set, taking them in and out. It's D, D, true? The, the, so let's move on. Where is the evaporator? So we start the question, the evaporator. The evaporator, where is the evaporator? And show the results. The evaporator, congratulations. I like that. So it's right up there. The evaporator is inside the house. All right. Where is the condenser? Where is the condenser? I start it now. The condenser. Everybody in? We'll stop it. And, okay. Well, the condenser wraps around the compressor, true? So that's where it's at, D. Now, last one, where is the expansion valve? Where is the expansion valve? Got to just give me the best answer for where is the expansion valve? Where do you think it is? This one stresses you a little bit. And I see I'm out of time, huh? Let me answer this question. Anyway, we stop it. And, yeah. Well, uh, the correct answer is A. And let's just, uh, I'm going to have to pick up there next time. I'm sorry I ran out of time. But, yeah, that last question was challenging.